Musicians and workers, good morning. Very good to see you all. And if you're visiting, I'm very honored to have you here with us. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah chapter 46. There is a desire in uh, some people's hearts to know future events. <clears throat> New York City is called by some the medium capital of the world just simply for the sheer number of psychics that reside in New York City. Do you know why? Wall Street traders. <laughs> they would really like advance information on what the stock market is gonna do. So you have on the one hand, you have people who, I want to know the future. On the other hand, there are others that the thought of the future brings great fear. They did a poll in Spain and Germany, numbers of people, 85 to 90% of people said they would not want to know the future if it contained bad events. So knowing the future. In the text that we're going to read, God himself tells us about his great wisdom. I've been talking about this, telling you one of the foundations of my life. I have a conviction. God is smarter than I am. Part of it is based on this verse that we're about to read. God says part of his wisdom that we can see is he knows the future in advance. He sees things that haven't even happened yet. And then he tells us what is still yet to come, and that is what the Bible calls prophecy. And he tells us the future in advance to save us and to help us. I'm going to preach about a, a, a sermon I've entitled, Seen in Advance. Isaiah chapter 46, we'll just read two verses. Verse 9 and 10, remember what happened long ago. Remember that I am God and there is no other God. I am God and there is no one like me. From the beginning, I told you what would happen in the end. A long time ago, I told you things that have not yet happened. When I plan something, it happens. What I want to do, I will do seen in advance. Let's begin. I want to talk about the principle of prophecy. A very important Bible subject has to do with prophecy. The word prophesy, prophecy, prophet, prophesied, all the different versions occur in the Bible 668 times. If you understand something about interpreting the Bible, any theme, any word that is repeated is important. So something that you see 668 times is very important. In the Old Testament, the word prophecy. It comes from a word in Hebrew to speak by inspiration from God as opposed to a, a, a human opinion. And it has the idea of a prediction. The New Testament, the word prophecy, or to, it, it means to foretell events or to speak beforehand. So when we're talking about prophecy, we're talking about things, uh, uh, predicting future events in advance before they happen. 28% of the entire Bible has to do with prophecy, has to do with predicting future events, or they were future at the time that they were written. And God, in the text that we just read, he says... Prophecy is what distinguishes him from any other so-called God. It is what distinguishes Christianity from other religions. Verse 9, remember what happened long ago. Remember, I am God, there is no other God. I am God and there is no one like me. God is speaking here. He's not talking about teaching. All religions have teachings. He's not speaking about ethics because many religions have uh, ethics. He says, 
other religions or other gods cannot predict the future in advance. And God says, I absolutely can. So why is it that accurate prediction of the future, why is that not common? Of course, that's partly sim simply because uh, of the difficulties of accurate prediction. I'm not talking about the Enquirer magazine, a member of the royal family will have something happen to him this year, you know. We're talking about accurate. I don't, I don't want to numb your brain with mathematics, but, you know, think about this. Who's going to win the football game? You can predict that. It's 50-50, right? Well, depending on your team. But, uh, <laughs> so, 50, you have a one in two chance of telling who's going to win the football team. But what about, what is the exact score going to be? And if we limit it to 50 points, then you get into picking the exact combination of numbers is one in 5,000. I could give you numbers that would hurt your head. It's very difficult to accurately predict things in advance. That's why not every religion and not every person can do it. But God says, I have a incredibly accurate track record in accurate prediction. Verse 9, he says, remember what happened long ago. And he is referring here what happened long ago. He's talking about his ability to predict the future. God has accurately predicted what would happen. Just Jesus Christ alone, there are more than 300 prophecies that were given, predictions of specific details of what would happen, and they were fulfilled exactly. Before he was ever born, it was predicted that he would be born in a, in a stable where animals are kept, that children would be killed because of his birth, that he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver, that while he's being killed, people would gamble for his clothes and that he would be buried in a borrowed tomb. All of those are things that were completely out of Jesus' hands. You, you can't determine as a baby where you're going to be born. On and on, what happens after you die? You can't predict that. And yet, God says, I can predict what would happen. He has accurately predicted when things will happen. The nation of Israel was destroyed. They were taken. The nation was completely uh, it ceased to exist. The people taken into exile in a foreign country. And God says, you will be in exile for 70 years. And 70 years to the day, they were allowed to uh, go home. And that was actually two different kings, the one who conquered them and the one who let them go. They were completely different men. And yet God could see the future in advance. He has predicted accurately exact details of how things will happen. Isaiah 44, 28 says, who says of Cyrus, this is God, says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt and the temple, let its foundations be laid. That one verse is incredible for a number of things. Number one, at the time it was written, the temple was still standing. And the city of Jerusalem was intact. So Isaiah is speaking by the inspiration of God. There's a man named Cyrus. He's going to rebuild. They're looking like, why rebuild? It's there. The other reason why this scripture is, is incredible is God names by name that man, Cyrus, a hundred and fifty years before he was born, there's going to be a man named Cyrus. He will cause the temple to be rebuilt and Jerusalem to be rebuilt. And that was exactly the case. This man came to power. God moved on his heart. He was not a believer in God. And one day he said, I've got an idea. How about you all can go free? You can go home and I will pay to help you rebuild your temple 
and your city that had been, de be de been destroyed by his predecessor. So here God is saying, I see things in advance before they ever happen. That is God's nature, his character. He knows the end in advance. Verse 10, from the beginning, I told you what would happen in the end. A long time ago, I told you things that have not yet happened. When I plan something, it happens. What I want to do, it will do. God says the reason why I can tell you what happens in advance is not just guessing or surmising. He says, because I planned it. I make a plan that a man named Cyrus is going to come to power and rebuild. Only God can do that because he's not like us. He is God. He has no human limitations. And he can do this because he arranges things according to his own will. Daniel 4, 17, the most high rules in the kingdom of men or where people live. He gives it to whomever he will and he sets over it the lowest of men. God says, who is in power is up to me. And this scripture, the lowest of men, I would dare say that that's accurately fulfilled. That's my political statement of the day. So think about Joseph. God knew far in the distance that a famine was going to come and God's people were going to be threatened. Their lives would be at stake. And God planned and arranged for a young man named Joseph to be sold into slavery, wind up in Egypt, be falsely accused, be put into prison with some of the king's officers, and from there he could accurately interpret a dream which caused him to come and be the second in command of the entire nation and therefore save all of God's people. God said, I saw it in advance. I predicted it in advance. So the future, seeing the future is more than just interesting facts. This is more than just reading about something that may or may not happen to the royal family. Who cares? You don't know any of them. I don't even know them. What we're talking about is things that will determine our lives and our futures. Verse 10, from the beginning, I told you what would happen in the end. And this is actually God's great concern with prophecy is what he says in this verse, the end. God speaks about the end of time. This world will not continue forever. Time is running out. And God has planned, if you will, a clock for the earth that has limited time and that time will run out. Daniel speaks about the time of the end. Acts, Timothy, and Peter in the New Testament, they all speak of the last days. So the time of the end that God is speaking here, there is a period of time that is a time of judgment. God, who is a righteous God, he looks upon sin. We see it in the book of Genesis chapter 6. God sees the sin that people do. That is offensive. And he says it must be punished. When we're talking about the end time, God is talking about a seven-year period in which God is going to pour out his judgment on the entire earth. By the halfway point of this seven-year period, uh, uh, up to one half of the entire population of the earth will be killed. We're rapidly approaching eight billion people in the, in the earth. You can't even grasp the, le the level that that will be of, of judgment by the end. Uh, uh, it's estimated two-thirds to three-quarters of the entire earth population will die. You can't describe that. I couldn't use enough negative and bad adjectives to describe how bad it will be. The best description, God says, those who are not killed during that time, they'll wish they were dead. That is how bad 
it will be. And so God always, in our text, he tells in advance of what he's going to do. Verse 10, from the beginning, I told you what will happen. In the end, now let's talk about the accuracy of prophecy, and I'll explain why I was inspired to uh, uh, preach this sermon in just a moment. God is incredibly accurate in his prophecies. He is so accurate, if you know the prophecies, when you read the news, it's like reading the Bible. Not that there's good things in the news like the Bible. I'm simply saying I, I am astounded each morning when I wake up. If I look at the news, it's like God said that would happen. In, incredible. Mark 13, 29. So you also, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near. It is at the door. So God is, is by design... He knows what will happen in advance, in the end. He plans what will happen in the end. And very deliberately, by design, God lets us see it unfold. One of the things that God says is, is an, an incredibly significant event, event that is coming. God prophesies there is going to come an attack on the nation of Israel by a coalition of nations. Predominantly, they're all Muslim except Russia. But Russia will lead this battle, a, a Muslim coalition. You can find this in Ezekiel 38. The reason why that is so significant, God says this one battle. Normally, we're used to wars change the world. God says one battle will change and reshape the entire world. Ezekiel 39, verse 2, speaking to this leader of Russia, he says, I will turn you back, talking about in this battle, and I will leave but the sixth part of you. In other words, this is an ancient way, I'll keep it simple. God says, only 16% of the entire army that comes to, to attack will survive. The vast majority of soldiers who will be involved in this attack, they're all a part of radical Islam. So in one battle, in one moment of time, all of these radical Islamic nations that come to attack, they will cease to be a factor in the world. God says the result of that, we understand when there is no longer the daily threat of radical Islam to the existence of the nation of Israel, the Bible says there's going to come in that seven-year period a world ruler, we call him the Antichrist, and Israel will sign a peace treaty. In other words, they will give their defense over to this man, he will promise. For them to give their defense over to any politician now would be suicide, right? Because every, their daily existence is the threat of attack. But when radical Islam is no longer a factor, now they will say, sure, we'll save a lot of money if we don't have to put all this money into defense. The Antichrist, this kind ruler who will come but that will only come out of this battle. Then the Bible says at the three and a half year mark of the seven year period, then the Antichrist, this man who seems so kind and helpful, he will betray them, the nation of Israel, and will do everything he uh, can to destroy Israel, which is going to cause them to turn to Jesus. Zechariah 12, nine and 10, on that day, this is talking about this battle, I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one whom they've pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves 
for a firstborn son. So God says, this is coming. I was inspired just in the last few weeks, as I said, every single day as I look at the news, I am astounded at the incredible accuracy of God's prophecy. Ezekiel 38 says, here's three things that I've, I've seen powerfully in the news the last few days that show us how wise God is. God says it is a coalition, Russia and many nations, but there are three main nations that God names, Russia, Iran, and Turkey. God says those are the main players that you're going to find in this great battle. Russia, Iran, and Turkey, three nations, each with their own personal national motivations of power. Russia wants to rule the world. I have a quote here, Ukrainian Foreign Minister Pavlo Klimkin, reversing the breakup of the Soviet Union and restoring the Russian Empire has now become an obsession for the Kremlin. So Russia, part of their motivation, they want to rule the world. Turkey wants to lead the Muslim world and revive the Ottoman Empire. You know, at one time, Turkey was incredibly powerful. This was called the, the uh, Ottoman uh, Empire. They were the ones that the Crusades were all about because the Turks controlled Jerusalem. They controlled the, the Holy Land. And what Turkey desperately wants is they want to be seen as the leaders of the entire Muslim world and revive their great Ottoman Empire. Iran has a power motivation. They want to blow up the world. That's their motivation. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating or joking. That is literally their aim. They believe if we blow up the world, if we can cause chaos in the world, they believe in someone who's coming. They call him the Mahdi. The, this is a Muslim ruler or an imam who will lead the world to a golden Muslim age. And so with this, I see in the news, uh, here is a, a, a quote, Iran now has enough uranium for a nuclear weapon, the UN watchdog reportedly says. An advisor, uh, Khomeini advisor, that's the leader of Iran, he says that Tehran is now capable of building a nuclear bomb. Israel will not allow this. They are not going to. They believe they have enough uh, uh, fissile nuclear material in order to be able to build nuclear weapons. And they want to fire them by missiles. They believe they're assembling them right now. Israel's not going to see this. What you've seen, if you paid attention at all for the last few months, this morning when I woke up again, at another assassination in, in uh, Lebanon, in Syria, in Iran itself, is anyone connected with the nuclear program, they've been dying. This morning when I woke up, one of the leaders, he's the guy in charge of missiles in the Revolutionary Guards, he was assassinated. He was killed. Israel is not going to allow this. Uh, Aviv Kochavi, he uh, makes a statement, he says, Israeli defense forces are preparing for a possibility of acting against the Iran nuclear program. And the Israeli military chief of staff, Lieutenant General Aviv Kochavi, he sent a message, this was a speech in which he was sending a message to Iran as part of his speech at the home front command exchange ceremony. Listen to this. The preparation of the military option against the Iranian nuclear pro program is a moral obligation and a national security order. Preparations for military action against the nuclear program are at the center of the preparations in the IDF, that's the Israeli Defense Force, and include a variety of operational plans, allocation of many resources, and acquisition of appropriate weapons, intelligence, and training. So, He's making it very clear, we will attack. We will not allow Iran to develop and deploy a nuclear weapon. They're going to do this. 
They're, the Iran's nuclear capability will be destroyed, which is going to increase their hatred for Israel even more. So think about this. 2,500 years ago, a man named Ezekiel, who is a prophet, one of those who God allows to see in advance and speak things in advance, 2,500 years ago, he says three main nations are going to unite themselves. You see this playing out to even today. Here's a, a, a quote, Iran, Russia, and Turkey, they held meetings last week to reshape the region. Another uh, headline, Russia and Iran, this is actually a picture of the meeting that they had. You know what's amazing about this is that Turkey, Erdogan is the, the uh, leader of Turkey, he's the man on the right, Turkey is a member of NATO. NATO exists to prevent Russia. 2,500 years ago, but God said, but Turkey's not going to be with NATO. They're going to be with Russia. They're going to join together. Why? Because God says, I see in advance. Second thing that Ezekiel 38 says, the underlying motivation in addition to hatred, in addition to simple power, Ezekiel 38 says, the motivation for the attack will be economic and financial. You know why it's profound that Russia, Iran, and Turkey are uh, going to be joined together, or they're joining together right now and will join an attack? Because all three of these nations are either failed or struggling economies. Look at some headlines. Seeking to crack Western unity, Putin sinks the Russian economy. Russia's economy is collapsing, data reveals. Here's Turkey. As Turkey's economic woes worsen, a new currency crisis is approaching. You think our inflation rate is bad? Turkey's inflation rate annually is 78.6%. <laughs> think about how difficult it would be to live there. Iran, unprecedented inflation hammers uh, Iran. I don't remember the number. I think theirs is like a, a, a mere 40-something percent. Iran's hopes for economic recovery are dashed by the IAEA condemnation. And then, here's the final, with Turkey's economy in crisis, Erdogan picks fights abroad. So 2,500 years ago, number one, God says, I'm going to tell you the three main nations that they will unite to attack Israel. Then God says it will be financial. There will be a huge financial attraction that will cause these nations to want to attack. Ezekiel 38, 13, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold? The wealth of Israel at this moment in time, currently their incredible wealth is natural gas. The fact that they have discovered massive deposits of natural gas actually changes things in the world. Israel has discovered as of right now just what they believe they have access to is 24 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Here's just a, some uh, headlines uh, just from the last few weeks or so. Energy and discovers new gas off Israel's coast. And then we see the billion dollar UAE, United Arab Emirates, Israel gas deal will go forward. So now Israel possesses something that is incredibly valuable. If you have a struggling economy, Israel is this tiny little landmass, why don't we just go wipe them out and take it over for ourselves? The reason why their, their natural gas changes things is because now 
other nations want to buy Israeli gas. This is from Al Jazeera. This is an Arab newspaper. This next quote, voices from the Arab press, Israel's new secret weapon is natural gas. You know what happened? I preached on this about Russia is that Russia in the battle for Ukraine, one of the things they've been doing is shutting off the gas supply to Europe to punish them. Germany in particular is very, very uh, at risk. And so now we see that Israel is starting to become, people are finally getting this. If we make deals with crazed despots who are running Russia, that means at some point, if they can turn on the gas, that means they can turn it off too. So now they're turning to Israel. Here's some quotes. Israel is ramping up their gas output, or Israel ramping up gas, gas output looks to help supply Europe. Another headline, Israel and Egypt sign a gas export deal as Europe seeks Russia alternative. Russia cannot allow Israel to become a supplier to the world because that lessens their money and it lessens their power. So now Ezekiel 38 says these three nations that God predicted they would come, they will have a financial advantage or a reason, a motivation in doing so. You can read it in the paper. This is playing out. Third thing that I've seen in the news that shows how smart God is, is that there are Muslim nations in Ezekiel 38 that will not take part in this attack, right? You think Muslims, they hate Israel. This is historically true back from the earliest Bible days, of course. God says there will be a primarily Muslim coalition, Muslim nations with Russia will come to attack Israel but in the middle of that, 2,500 years ago, God says there will be Muslim nations that will not take part in the attack. Verse 13, Ezekiel 38, Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty to carry away silver and gold, livestock and goods to take great plunder? Sheba and Dedan, you know who those are? Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. They didn't exist when the scripture was written. But God who knows the future in advance. So let's look at headlines recent. Saudi Arabia in joint talks over, or over joint defense against Iran. Israel and Saudi Arabia make a deal for security arrangements in the Straits of Tehran for flyover rights. Here's another headline. Iran has brought Israel and the Gulf states closer. Next headline. Israel signs a free trade deal with the United Arab Emirates. And the final headline. Israel and Bahrain sign a security cooperation agreement. How could anyone know that 2,500 years ago before it happened? Because he's God. And he says, I see things in advance. Let's talk finally about the purpose of prophecy. God has some very specific aims in mind why he tells us things in advance and lets us see these things come together. Number one, God's love gives warning so people will repent and avoid judgment. Mark 1, 15, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Every person living in sin deserves judgment, but in the love of God, he does not want people to ju be judged. So what he does, he tells us in advance and lets us see it play out. Why? So sinners will repent. The question is, will you listen to the warnings God gives and repent? Hebrews eleven seven 7, by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, he built an ark to save his family. God told him judgment is coming. Genesis 6, for 120 years he preaches <coughs> judgment is coming. 
But then it says these awesome words, <coughs> and then God called him into the ark, his family, and God shut the door. So <coughs> apparently there were people for all those years that didn't pay attention to the warnings. Got a headline here I want you to see. This is interesting because Lisa and I have been here many times. Some of the people here, the pastors, have probably been to this lion park. Headline, lion victim ignores warnings. In 2015, a woman tourist, this is an American lady, driving in a lion park in Johannesburg was attacked and killed by a lion that got into the open window of her car. The park manager said the main rule was broken not to have windows down. There are more than 40 signs with pictures and text warning visitors keep their windows rolled up and stay in their cars. Other people saw this couple driving around with the windows down and warned them, roll your windows up, but they ignored the signs and the warnings. And so sure enough, exactly what they were warned about, the lion grabbed her inside the vehicle and killed this woman. I'm preaching this sermon because some of you are not right with God. You better read the signs. God allows you to see this in advance so you can read the signs and repent. The second reason why God tells us this in advance is because he wants his people to have confidence in troubling, uh, troubling times. You know, in, in crazy times in which we live, it's possible for God's people to be filled with fear. There are people, you have been troubled. What's going to happen to our nation? What's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to our children? Matthew 24, 6, you'll hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end isn't yet. Other translations say, be not alarmed. Don't be afraid. Don't panic. Don't be frightened or troubled. Listen, I want to tell you something about God. If he, can, if he can plan it in advance, see it in advance before it ever happens, the future is in God's hands. Listen, God is in control. He was in control when he planned it. He was in control when he had the prophet say it. And he is in control while we're living it. God's control isn't dependent on circumstances. Be honest. You ever look at the, that, at the news and the insanity? You know, like, what is a woman? Are we, did we seriously ask that question in this day and age? Like, <laughs> God, did you lose control? Were you, like, sleeping? Were you taking care of China? You forgot this world is insane. No, 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 not at all. God plans circumstances. Amir Sarfati says, remember, things are not falling apart. They're falling into place. That's actually what's happening. He's getting ready for the end. And finally, God does this because he wants us to have an urgency for our labors in evangelism of the lost. Anybody who's not right with God, they're going to be judged by God in hell forever. If we believe that, we must do everything we can to save people from judgment. John 9, verse 4. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, for the night is coming when no one can work. Limited time. The hope for us as believers is before that seven-year period, God says every true believer will suddenly disappear off this earth and then that judgment comes. That is our hope. And we know, believers know in advance what's coming. You know what happened just a few months ago? Uvalde, Texas. A gunman, young teenager, 18-year-old troubled young man entered a school in Uvalde, Texas shot and killed 19 children and two adults. Within minutes, when the alarm went out that this gunman was in the school, 376 law enforcement officers came to the school. Within three minutes, all that was between 
numbers of officers who had bulletproof vests, they had weapons, one of them had a ballistic shield, one door. All they had to do was go through one door and take out that young man. He had just started killing people, but instead it was an hour and 14 minutes later by the time they finally entered the class to confront the gunman. During that time, 19 children, two adults were killed. Why didn't they go in? Partly because they didn't know what was on the other side. But you know what? People are outraged now. What you're seeing in the news, this is playing out. You see the hearings and the different reports and the video footage. People are outraged because they're saying, how can you not, if you know that there's a gunman there determined to kill people and children, how can you not do everything in your power to save them? And they're saying, we didn't know what was on the other side. Listen to me. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you know what I'm preaching today? We do know what's coming. So my question to you is, how can we not do everything in our power? We know what people are facing in the end times. And this is why God allows believers, you know God's word, and daily in the news. As I said, I woke up this morning, another piece of the puzzle in the news coming together. God lets us see that in advance so that we will not only get right ourselves if that's what needs to happen, not only that we'll have confidence, but we'll do everything we can to save those who are facing judgment. I want you to bow your heads, if you would, just for a moment all across this place. Thank God, as I bring this service to a close, very first of all, there are people this morning what I preached is not good news at all because you are one who is facing that judgment that I'm talking about. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. God judges sin. He's already judged the entire world once with a flood, and he says this time in fire. And every person who is not right with God, he says you will be judged on this earth and you will be judged in hell forever. But at the same breath that I tell you that, I want you to know how much God loves you. The Bible says God is not willing. He doesn't want you to be judged. So he does everything in his power to save you. And that is why I said God allows the future to be written in advance. He allows you to see it in advance so you can read the warning signs and say, you know what, I want to be ready. I want to miss out. I don't want to be judged. See, you don't have to be judged because Jesus was judged for you. Why, why pay for your sin when Jesus has already paid it all with his death on the cross? And what you need to do, if sin is what brings judgment, you need to deal with the sin problem. I don't know what form sin is taking in your life. I don't know if that's sleeping with people you're not married to. Is that bitterness, hatred, racial prejudice? It's just simply rebellion against God. Whatever it is, you need to turn from your sin, believe on Jesus Christ, then you can be saved. For believers, everything that I said this doesn't have to give you fear because there's a hope in Jesus. There's an answer. There's a way out. I'm asking right now, how many of you here this morning, you are not right with God and as God would deal with you? If you're not right, but you want to fix that, you want to pray this morning for God to forgive your sins, then I want you to do one thing. I want you to lift up your hand. How many would there be? Pastor Greg, I'm not right with God. I know that. I want to get saved this morning. Lift up your hand. By lifting your hand, you're saying, I want to pray and I want to turn from my sin. How many would there be? Lift up your hand right now. I am not saved. I know that. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. In the middle, God bless you. How many others want to get right with God? I'm not asking, do you go to church? You can go to church and not be right with God. 
I'm not even asking, do you believe the Bible? I'm asking, are you willing to turn from your sin? Do you believe on Jesus Christ? You want to turn from your sin? How many others? Lift up your hand. God's dealing with people. Lift up your hand right now. Some of you are backslidden. You were saved in the past. God's dealing with you. Backslider, lift up your hand right now. I want to get saved. I want God to save me. Lift your hand right now. God loves you. He wants to help you. Anybody else? There are some of you, you come to church week after week, but you're not right with God. In mercy, God allows messages like this to be plant, uh, preached. He allows the news for you to see it because he's trying to get your attention. What a fearful thing it would be. That moment when God causes every true believer to disappear from this earth so judgment begins and you're still here knowing what's coming. How many here you want to get right with God? Anybody else? Quickly, lift your hand up. I'm not saved. There are numbers of people who lift their hands. You need to join them. Thank God. I want only those that lifted their hands. Nobody else. If you lifted your hand, look up at me for a minute. Just those several people. You mean that? Yes? Just nod your head. Amen. Come here. I want to have someone pray with you. If you'll come, I'm going to have someone pray. I want you all to stand up to your feet. If you would, we're going to pray in just a moment of time. You help these people have the courage to come. I'm dealing with some of you. You need to get right with God. Others of you, you need to take peace and comfort that God is in control. And others, God's dealing with you to tell people and evangelize those that are not ready. We're going to sing. The altars are open. You come right now. Thank God. God for his faithfulness right now. God, we thank you for your goodness. Hallelujah, Lord God. We are grateful, Lord God, for all you are. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord God. The future is in your hands. Praise God. Hallelujah. God, thank you, Jesus, for your goodness. Oh, God, I'm grateful for your faithfulness. Praise God. Amen. We're going to be dismissed in prayer. I want to invite you tonight. 
is going to be the farewell service for John and Dana Duff, our couple that we're launching, sending to Sarasota, Florida. And uh, so in tonight will be the launching service. We'll be praying for them as a congregation. And then there's going to be a time of uh, f fellowship as a farewell. Every